everyone. Welcome to another afternoon uh, as part of our series Together with Parents. This afternoon, we have our special guest speaker, Natalie Hale. She is an award-winning author and innovative educator, parent of an adult son with Down syndrome, and for over two decades, a national and international speaker on the topic of teaching reading to learners with Down syndrome and other developmental delays. In 2000, she founded Special Reads for Special Needs to provide parents and educators with reading books and materials specifically designed for learners with special needs. Her Facebook page is a popular source of teaching information, as is her YouTube channel. Her latest book, published by Woodbine House, is Whole Child Reading. Her previous books with Woodbine are Down Syndrome Parenting 101, Must Have Advice for Making Your Life Easier, and a workbook for teens and adults titled Managing My Money, Banking and Budgeting Basics. She is also the author of the book, Oh Brother, Growing Up with a Special Needs Sibling, published by the American Psychological Association. All her books are available on Amazon. Natalie currently lives in Los Angeles. In non-COVID times, she continues to travel and teach parents and educators across the country and across borders through her reading workshops. In COVID times, she teaches through webinars, Facebook, and her YouTube channel. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Ms. Hale. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, one of the things I would like to ask people to use the chat box for is I'd like to know the ages of your learners or your students, depending on whether you're a parent or an educator gives me a good idea of where to direct parts of my presentation. So what I'd like to do is begin at the beginning. I'm going to share my screen and start my PowerPoint. All right. Great. All right. Uh, a high interest reading program that works. And I think the key word here is works. <laughs> you know, so many of our kids are in school systems where they're using the same program that they've used for a long, long, long time, whether it works or not. And that is what I would love to change. So here are some of my students working with some of my materials. Now, I'm not gonna be talking about my reading program until the end. What I wanna do is teach you strategies and a basic approach to how do our kids with special needs learn most easily and most quickly. We want success, but we need it pretty fast so that they don't get discouraged. So uh, one SLP that I work with calls my program delight-based learning, not brain-based, but delight-based. And that is incredibly important, incredibly important. All right. And I say meet their need and they will read. So how do we meet their need? Well, it's pretty simple. We go in through the heart and teach to the brain. We go in through the heart and teach to the brain. That is the secret. So what do I mean by that? We're, we'll cover that. So in my book, Whole Child Reading, the whole book is explains that approach and the strategies that are designed to work well with that. But I designed it specifically for our kids with Down syndrome, autism, and other developmental delays because there's so many crossover learning challenges, whether it's PDD-NOS, whether it's autism, whether it's a dual diagnosis of DSASD, doesn't matter. There are so many similar learning difficulties. So here's your list for today. This is what we're going to cover. Where does this information come from that I'm going to give you? What does it mean going through the heart and teach the brain? I'm going to teach you about the 11th commandment, which I'm sure you've never heard of. I made it up. All right. And the neurology behind that 11th commandment, eight foundations of my program for teaching quickly. What is the basis? What are the foundational things that we need to always keep in mind? And 
three special education guidelines I'll give you and three brain strategies in the program. And these strategies and these guidelines and these foundations you can take and apply to any reading program that you're working with. If you're homeschooling, this is a, you know, a shoe in this is a piece of cake. If you're not homeschooling and things are not going well with school, then I'm hoping that what I'm teaching you is gonna help you change that. All right, continued. The three brain friendly, brain important strategies are fast flash, sandwich style teaching, and errorless testing techniques. Now, absolutely everything that I'm gonna talk about today is in the book whole child reading. And the good news is it's a small book. Uh, it's my third book with uh, Woodbine House. And when I approached the editor, I said, look, parents don't have time to read the two huge tomes you've already published on reading many years ago. Uh, and they have two that are out that have been around for a long time. And I said, parents don't have time. Teachers don't have time. So I tell people about those books and I say, use it as a reference book. So use them for reference. But I said, we need a small book that's a quick read, no fluff, no extra stuff in it, just what they need. And she said, you're right, okay, good, let's go for it. So that's where how that book happened, Whole Child Reading. And of course it's on Amazon. How to go in through the heart, we'll cover that. And then the materials in my program, which model the strategies and the theories that I'm teaching you today and resources for you because we've got about uh, four weeks, four and a half weeks, I think, until our next gathering. So I want you to have resources in the meantime, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of homework. All right, where does this information come from? It is a synthesis. I pulled together what I consider the most effective techniques and strategies that have been developed for teaching our learners since the 1950s around the globe, and you can read the details there. All right, but this is a quick overview. So starting at the bottom in 1955, that's when Glenn Doman began his work at his Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential. Now, eventually in 68, he wrote the book, how to Teach Your Baby to Read, which was for a gen ed audience. It was for neurotypical children. But the irony is all of his work in the beginning was with our kids. He found out what worked with our kids and then of course realized it would work with the general population. So in 68, he published that book, which is still in print in 40 languages. The only reason it's still around is it works. And you don't have to start with your baby. You can start wherever you are. What I'm giving you today in the technique of fast flash and sandwich style teaching, which I'll talk about later, that's the core of the book. You don't actually have to read the book because I'm giving it to you. So 1970, Pat Olwine began amazing work with Down syndrome at the University of Washington, but she didn't publish till 95. Now, right here in the heart center, 1989 is where I was with my four and a half year old son with Down syndrome, severe ADHD and ODD, oppositional defiant disorder. So I'll tell you what happened. But in the meantime, in 83, Down Syndrome Education International, which is a fabulous research and teaching organization, they got established, but they didn't publish anything until 2001 up here. Now, in 83, at the same time in the US, Bob Doman, nephew of Glenn Doman, broke off and formed the National Association for Child Development, which does miracles with all of our kids. It's just amazing. All right, they, to my knowledge, have not published anything, but they have a ton of stuff on YouTube. All right, and then in Canada, 95, Down Syndrome Research Foundation of Canada. And, and keep in mind, yeah, it might be a Down Syndrome Research Foundation, but so much of it is applicable across the board. All right, so 95, whoops, I jumped ahead. I have a hyperactive mouse. All right, so in 08, we finally got this these guys at a store here in the US. 
Southern California got very impatient with having to pay our for our stuff in pounds. And they said, no, no, we need a USA base. Okay, great. Now we've got it. All right. Now, back in 1989, when I was teaching my son to read, I had zero to read except to go on. I mean, much less a reading program being published that, that would work for my son. All I had to go on was his baby book, which was fine. But the big deal was that I had a mentor who had gone here, who had worked at Glenn Doman's Institute for several years because of his own daughter who was globally delayed. So that's where it started. We've come a long way. All right, I'm gonna be talking about right brain learning techniques. And I want you to know what the background of that is. In Japan, Dr. Shichida and the Heguru Method got started back in 78, 86. Now it's worldwide. It's not surprising that we don't know about any of these because, you know, my big suspicion is it's free. <laughs> you can't, it, it's not a multi-million dollar program. It's free. You just take these techniques and apply them. Anyway, of course, it's not free to go to the NACD and have the staff work with your child. But the basic premises. All right. So here we go. So this is my four and a half year old reading his very first book, no pictures, no pictures, just text. You, if you see over here where my cursor is, that's the gutter of the book. So everything he's holding in his hands there is the right hand page. The type was enormous. I was taking Glenn Doma's book literally. I thought the book that you make had to be the same size as the flashcards, which is not true, but hey, it worked for him. So. Here he is at almost five, and here he is at 18, reading a very different kind of book to the same grandma. All right, so by, actually by age eight, eight and a half, he was an independent reader. My job was so over. I hit it every day from the time he was four and a half, almost every day, six days a week maybe, uh, until he was just what I call launched. He was just reading independently. Now we go in through the heart, I said, and teach to the brain. Okay, I said, what does this mean? It's very simple. It means that in the beginning of this whole literacy journey, in the very beginning, before they have any skill, before they have any success, everything that we put in front of them is high interest. And I mean, it's about them. It's about what they love. That's the going in through the heart part, because right away, we've got neurology on our sides. We've got you know, neurotransmitters on our side. Mm, things are going great. He's very interested. She, he is very interested in reading because it's about her, him. It works like magic. Now, the second part is, OK, you, you have these the topics that you want to ha build the materials around. Well, we have to design it for the brain. And we have to teach with methods that go into the brain really, really well. Not only that can be perceived really well, but we want it retained. And that's what these strategies are going to be about. But there are eight big foundations to everything that I'm going to teach you and what I would love for you to just take into your heart and brain and just keep there. All right. First, we teach reading for meaning which you would think is a brand new concept because for a long time now, we don't teach reading for meaning. We teach reading for decoding and, and synthetic phonics. Next month, we're going to talk about phonics and comprehension. I, I don't have time to cover that today in our hour. Trust me, we will talk about it. We will talk about it. But when we teach reading for meaning, we teach like, I'll go into that. We do not drill synthetic phonics emphasize low interest words, and I'm talking here about the high frequency words, in, and, onto, under, those. All right, and here's a little story to uh, give you an example of that. All right, so every book that my son, every reading book that he had was what I had to make. All right, there wasn't a program, so I made every single personal book myself for him. It helped that I was an illustrator <laughs> and a calligrapher. So in the beginning, I'm using marker, right? But um, 
he didn't have pictures on the same page as his text. He had to read the text first and then he'd get a reward a few days, a few pages later and he'd turn it and he'd get a picture. At any rate, so he's an independent reader by about eight and a half or so. All right, so he's 16. We go to the Lion King on Broadway and it's a great show, of course. It's a family favorite, we love it. All right, at intermission, his dad and his sister and I go out to get something to drink. And Jonathan is sitting with this big, beautiful program that I bought him with all the tiny print about the background on the artists and all that. I said, Jonathan, you want to come out, get something to drink? No, 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 I'm reading. I said, okay. All right, so we're driving home in the car after the show. And his dad and his sister and I are raving about Scar. Oh, wow, wasn't he marvelous? Oh, he, we didn't know who he was. We just, you know, we're just talking about Scar. And Jonathan from the back seat pipes up, yeah, Scar was played by Patrick Page, and he also played Lumiere in the Broadway production of Beauty and the Beast. And the three of us are going, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> but from the get-go, everything I put in front of him was of super high interest. It was about him. Now, eventually, you branch out. But by that time, they've got success on their side, right? Two. We teach letter sounds from the beginning. Don't even worry about the names. That will happen so easily, you wouldn't believe it. But we teach letter sounds from the beginning, all right? I recommend an app that is at fabulous for that, Starfall ABC. Used to cost three or four bucks, now it's free. And the part of it that I want you to focus on is the ABC part, the, they have letter blocks. All right, so you tap on, the beauty of it is, you tap on the letter, the letter parades out and you hear the letter name once. Then every time you tap that letter or your child taps it, you hear ah, 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 ah. If it's A, A came out, you heard A, okay. Ah, ah, ah. So when I'm teaching, I tap the letter, and I say it and I ask the child to say it and then we do it again and then we do it again and then we do it again. And I recommend if the child does or teen or adult does not know the letter sounds absolutely wonderfully yet, take three letters a week. Start with ABC, next week go on to the next three. Go all the way through the alphabet, start all over again when you finish, and of course drop the letters that the, the, the learner is catching on to and knows. All right. So why not stress the letter names? Why do we do the sounds from the beginning? Well, here's an example. One of the learning weaknesses that typically our kids have is a short auditory memory. And I'll talk more about that later, but a short auditory memory. All right, so I hear what you said last. So if I'm teaching you that this jagged line is W, I say, this is W. What's that letter? U. You're going to say you because you have short auditory memory. If, on the other hand, I say this jagged line, this line is wuh, well, I just gave you decoding club, didn't I? I gave you power. Now, here is an amazing little video that I found on YouTube years after I'd been preaching about the letter W, right? So this is for your entertainment, as we say in Los Angeles. <laughs> say A. A. B. B. C. K. D. K. E. A. F. F. G. T. H. S. I. I. J. T. K. K. L. L. M. L. N. A. O. O. P. P. Q. Q. R. L. S. S. T. D. U. L. V. W. W? W? Doctor. Good job! X? 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 Y? Y? Z? Z. Yay! Good job, John David! Okay. That's so adorable and it makes my point. Okay. Third foundational thought is we teach meaningful whole words. Meaningful. Meaningful. We teach using right hemisphere brain techniques. Oh, and by meaningful, I mean meaningful to the, the learner, not us. <laughs> All right, we teach using right hemisphere brain techniques. Five, if we teach phonics, we which we may not have to do, I'll explain as we go along, especially next, next month. 
If we teach phonics, we teach analytic phonics, not synthetic phonics. What's the difference? We'll go into that next week, next month. Six, we design all material for the brain. Clarity, clarity, clarity. That is what we're interested in. We want to tell the brain where to look without making it hard. Seven, teach twice a day. And I'm talking about, and I'll show you later, five minutes twice a day to start with, if that's where your learner is, if you have an emergent learner who is impatient or who can't focus or whatever. Twice a day is the critical part for the brain. The brain, the brain learns with frequency. You know, when you were a kid learning to ride a bike, at least my generation did, I think you, people still are, you were on it every day, right? And you never, ever forget how to ride a bike. It's the same with reading. You never forget how to read once, you're, once you read. That's it. You're done. You're, you're fixed for life. But twice a day makes a huge difference versus once a day for the brain simply because of the frequency. All right. So talking about that twice a day, you only have two options in teaching reading. One works and, well, the other doesn't. All right. So your options are pedal to the metal. And what I mean by that is you're at it day after day after day after day, maybe six days a week knowing you're not going to do that forever. This is just until you have a little reader on your hands. The other version is the start and stop, start and stop, which leaves you with a jalopy instead of a race car. You're just going to hardly get there. It will be very, very difficult. Now, number two, the start and stop scenario is why I get teenagers who can't read in my office. Because that's what happened. Maybe they had a really great teacher in kindergarten. She was actually starting to teach them to read. And then after a couple of years, they transferred to another school. They didn't know how to teach reading. The ball got dropped. And here's a problem. Uh, parents are so overloaded. We've got speech therapy, OT, with SLP, OT, PT, medical appointments out of up the waz, and we feel so trusting about, they're teaching him at school. I don't have to worry about this. Well, sometimes that's wonderfully true, and sometimes it's not. And the start and stop method winds up with a teenager who's frustrated and totally discouraged. Mom and dad are discouraged. Teachers don't know what to do because he doesn't even want to go near a book, etc. So if you can do pedal to the metal, that'll get you there so fast. All right, number eight, follow the special education basic rules. There are three that apply no matter what you're teaching. Small task size. If your learner is saying, it's too hard, guess what? It's too hard. Reduce the task size. You know, if you know the handwriting program, Handwriting Without Tears, Jen Olson's the founder. She's a good friend of mine. and She's brilliant. What she did was take the task and make the task size small. You can print, you can learn to print the entire uppercase alphabet with big line, little line, big curve, little curve. That's it. You need you have four shapes for the whole thing. So she simplify, simplify. Small task size, frequency. I already talked about that a little bit. Duration. We keep the if because of brain fatigue and personalities and focusing ability, if you can keep the, the teaching duration short, keep it short. For instance, in the classroom, if you've got 40 minutes a day, for example, for literacy work, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon, that will do 100 times as much as one 40 minute session and you know you're going to lose them part way through because you know they've just had it you know in teaching teaching my students i can just see the brain fatigue kick in you know especially if mom and dad wanted want them to have a 45 minute lesson or maybe even longer you know i have to break it up let's get stand up and play ball or whatever because i can just see the the brain efficiency dropping so if we keep it short we avoid that and we get to success faster and they feel so good about 
succeeding. All right. Now, as far as the whole child reading program goes, three strategies. You don't have any more than that. Yeah, I gave you a whole bunch of foundations, but there are only three strategies for implementing this program. Ask Flash, Sandwich Style Teaching, and Errorless Testing. And we're going to go into all of this. All right, later. First of all, I want to talk about we go in through the heart, I said, and teach to the brain. I'm sure you've got this memorized by now. How do we go in through the heart? All right, we introduce reading with high interest materials. Why is this so important? Why is the high interest base so important? Here we get to the commandment because of the 11th commandment. <clears throat> now, I don't know if any of you are old enough to know who this is. <laughs> but this is Charlton Heston in the movie, The Ten Commandments, of, you know, 100 years ago. Now, notice the bottom line. A friend of mine put this in there for me. No, no, no. I mean, that's what I heard from my son for <laughs> many years, which is why I wrote the parenting book, Down Syndrome Parenting 101, which can actually is a crossover book uh, to other developmental delays. But in that book, I was such an expert at non-compliance <laughs> that I devoted two chapters to techniques, strategies for how do we deal with this? You know, because you use one strategy and the kid catches on after a while and that doesn't work at all. It worked in the beginning, but now it's not working. So the two chapters in that parenting book, one is born to rule. And the second chapter is the non-compliance face off. Anyway, so that's why no, no, no is in there. All right. So here's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not dare to teach children with special needs anything that interests them not. Verily, they shall be interested only in that in which they are interested in and shall not be interested in any other thing. Woe be unto those who do not revere and abide by this commandment. Amen. And if I could see your, your thumbnails, I would ask for a show of hands for how many people. <laughs> Know this commandment because they live it. All right. So let's go a little further. Is it scientifically based, this part, this idea about going in through the heart? Let's look at the neurology behind that commandment. And if you want to really hit, see some really interesting YouTube videos, just put in the neurology of learning. Just search for that. It's pretty amazing. Now we have this, you know, burgeoning field that we didn't have 20 years ago. We just didn't have it. All right. Neuromodulators. These are the guys that we want on board. And guess what triggers their release? High interest, close to the heart topics, materials. So here they are. We have dopamine. That is when we make things really interesting and that hits the save button in the brain's computer. All right, so we make it interesting, we make it fun. Acetylcholine is the neuromodulator that gets released when you've gotten the point across that, oh, this is important. You know, this other stuff's not so important. But, oh, wow, this is so important. So that, that neuromodulator wakes up and you get better retention. And then there's norepinephrine. And we all rely on this, and I'll tell you in a sec. It's when anything new pops up. So norepinephrine is the culprit that is responsible for all of us staying on Facebook an hour past when we should have gone to bed, Facebook or YouTube or whatever, because it's new. And we get bing, ping, ping. We get these wonderful little hits. And then we wind up miserable because we lost sleep and didn't do the laundry, etc. All right. So, all right. Materials for going in through the heart. Personal pages. We're going to talk about that today. And I would like you to do that for homework. Personal books. We'll talk about it next time a deep dive into that into lotto games next time and into modified books now everything i'm showing you here these four are to varying degrees labor intensive because you got to do them yourself personal pages not labor intensive five minutes no pictures awesome you don't need a computer or a printer it's an awesome tool 
But the other three we'll talk about, we'll do a deep dive into next time. But right now we're going to do a shallow dive into them so I can show you. But explained in detail in the book. All right. Personal books. All right, here's a, uh, I think Jonathan was about a year into learning to read. And he and his sister put some music on. She built this personal book, Fortress. And they were dancing in the middle of the fortress. And I was blown away. So, of course, I raced for the camera. We didn't have phones. <laughs> phones with cameras. That I raced for the camera and took a picture. All right. We engage. This is it. That's critical. With their topics, not ours. Here's an example of a personal book that you create on com computer. Notice that's page two, three, four, five. All right. So page one was the title of the little personal book. All right. And you're working with full eight and a half by 11. Okay. Full, full, full. All right. Um, so ideally you want to do this. You do not want to have on the left side of the page, I like Olaf, and on the right side of the page, there's this nice picture of Olaf. That's not reading, that's just queuing off the picture. So we first ask them in these personal books, the way I teach them, we first ask them to read. There's no picture cue. Picture cue works pretty well with neurotypical children. With our kids, we've lost them. They're off on the picture and to get them back on the hard work, are reading those little black marks on the page, very difficult. So we eliminate that in the beginning, not forever, just for emergent readers that we're trying to really grab and make successful and get them enthusiastic. All right, lotto games. These are some that I produce on my site. Uh, next time we'll do a deep dive into how do you make these yourself. And modified books, here's an example. Let's say I'm six years old, I'm crazy about Frozen and you wanna teach me to read. And so you got this Step Into Reading book, uh, which is Random House as a publisher. Uh, and I love their books for modifying. So if I'm, I, I can't read yet, but I can read Anna, but you know, the type is, uh, okay. I've modified the book and now I'm showing it to this six year old who can't read. And she already can read Anna because she's seen it everywhere on Disney. Oh, no, is an emotionally charged phrase that is super easy for kids to learn. And then you just got two words. You got two, two verbs. So that is what we will talk about next time. So what I have done to contribute to the, going through the heart materials that you don't have to lift a finger for are these picture books, which go with my reading bundles. And if you, do you see a common theme here? Peanut butter, ice cream, pizza, spaghetti, <laughs> macaroni. Uh, yeah, it's all about food because I figured, whereas I could create personal books for my son about his trains and his sister and his family and all of that, you know, I thought, well, I can hopefully hit most learners with food. All right, so you got that part. How do we teach the brain? All right, three strategies. All right, fast flash, sandwich style teaching, errorless testing. Let's do a deep dive. Okay, what's fast flash? The right hemisphere learning technique of teaching with flashcards, it works with how the brain likes speed and perception and retention. So I'll talk about how fast. It works well with students who are strong visual learners, typically the case with autism and Down syndrome. All right, how fast? One card per second. That's the slowest I'd ever want you to go. Two per second if possible. And by the way, in neurological research, they have found when I talk about speed, uh, and we can go more into this next time, but the speed at which information can travel across a neuron is has been clocked at 200 miles an hour. So. And the brain, like, yes, even the brain of children with special needs, developmental delays, the brain still likes to, to, to keep it that way, to take it in that way because they can keep it better. All right, so hope you, hope you cannot hear the plane overhead. All right, so here is a, an example. Are you ready? Okay. One, pizza. No, yum. Yes. One, pizza. No, yum. Yes, 
You want pizza? No. Yum. Yes. Awesome. You watch so well. Thank you. All right, now, a couple of crucial things. You notice he does not repeat the word. We don't want the child repeating the word. We don't want speech in there. We want eyes, ears, brain, that's it. So if the child repeats the word, you're going to have to, re because that's how they are trained typically at school, you're going to, because they're doing the very slow flashing and talking about each word. And we don't do that because we want the brain to get it. So. If the child has the habit of repeating the word, which she probably does, just I just kept saying zip the lip, zip the lip, zip the lip until the child, the student catches on and stops doing it. So if they have time to say the word, you're going way too slow. That's another hint that will help you. All right, this is a resource that I have. I have on my YouTube channel, which I'll give you uh, information about at the end in my resource section at the end. Um, I have got 75 or so short videos. They're about maybe four, four minutes or so, sometimes a little bit longer. And each one is a tip on teaching reading. So this is a sample of one of the ones here and it ties into Fast Flash, so I want you to watch it. Let's talk about some Fast Flash mistakes that can derail you. You're going to use five cards in a group, you're going to flash them from back to front. You're going to grab them at the top center of the card so that you can move them more quickly. You're going to do it three times in succession, and you're going to try to do it quickly, one or two cards per second. Practice makes perfect. Here are some don'ts. Don't move the cards around the side. You'll never move them fast enough. Don't call out the word before it actually lands in your hand. For instance, don't do this. Ears, nose, teeth. You understand. All right. And don't slant the cards down or up, making it more difficult for the child to see. And lastly, don't let the child repeat the word. If the child repeats the word, you're going way too slow. And we only want eyes and ears so that the brain can retain it really quickly. Here are some do's. Do laminate the cards. They'll move much faster. Do sit across from the child so you can see the child's eyes and where the attention is. Do hold the cards a little bit above the child's eye level. Neurolinguistic programming loves that position. And what if the child won't look at the cards? Slap them down on the table three times in succession. I've never seen that fail with a student that won't look up. So I hope that helps. And at the next slide, your homework slide, I've given you a link to my YouTube channel where you can see me working with it. All right. All right. <clears throat> I recommend five cards in a group. You can do two groups once the, stu the student starts catching on. The reason for five is that typically our kids with developmental delays have five, comfortably five working memory channels. For the typical population, it's more like seven, sometimes nine, but five works really well. So once they start catching on, you can put one group down, pick up another group of five, but you're not gonna do 10 three times in a row, all right? So flash the group three times, repetition, 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 then put it down. All right, make them big and make them red. Now this is a picture from the cover of one of the editions of Glenn Dolman's book, How to Teach Your Baby to Read. So eventually they can be small and black. You can just be buying regular flashcards, which of course are always in black ink, why red? Let's see. Did I have that? Yeah. Why the speed and why red? Okay. Here's a, for a toddler, two inch high is the great place to start. And yeah, you're going to be using poster board and cutting it down. That's how I started with my four and a half year old. For an older learner, it's not, it's not necessary to have it that big. All right. Why the speed and why red? The speed I already talked about. Why red, um, the brain, studies have been done on this. The brain prefers red, the brain likes red. So, you know, you can ask the kindergarten teacher who ordered 30 red chairs for her kindergarten class and the manufacturer messed up and sent 15 red and 15 blue. Now, was there a fight over the red chairs? Yes. All right, 
Speed plus size plus frequency equals brain success. All right, I was gonna go into more detail about, I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> um, why we have to move the card so fast? I'll go through this very, very quickly um, because we wanna get to the other two strategies. All right, you have to understand that what I'm recommending with Fast Flash is a process of maturing the visual pathway. If we don't practice it, there's no progress and there's no process. It's like a jungle. If the visual pathway is immature, I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, this is a very complicated process. Uh, the visual perception has to come first, then visual recognition, then mental association with what that word is, then solidifying that, et cetera. All right, and then retaining it. What we want is automatic recognition or what we call orthographic reading, right? I'm going to skip over this. So this is what the jungle looks like if the child can't read at all. So you're working with fast flash and it's, oh man, I, I can see it cleared away a little bit. That's on Monday. You come back on Wednesday and she's forgotten everything you ever taught her. That's normal. We expect that. Don't worry about it. We just keep going day after day. And then this happens. We have a pathway. All right. So um, I'm going to skip over this. The visual, we have um, a professor. Stanislaw Stahany says, oh, we have a visual system. We have a language system. We need an interface. We need a way to connect the two of them. And I'm saying that fast flash is the way to do it. All right. All right. There's a vast difference in the amount of visual pathway maturity required to recognize the big yellow McDonald's M and tiny little details in serif fonts. Okay. So we work on it gradually, and you would be amazed how fast large type goes to smaller, goes to smallest type without a problem. You would be amazed once the process really gets going. All right, what if the child won't focus? You just saw the little video I showed you of me encouraging you to slap the cards down. Slap it down as you're calling them out. Scoop it up, do it again. Scoop it up, do it again. I've never seen that not work. And I use it as an interim technique because for neurolinguistic programming, we do want the eyes a little bit above the horizon. So I will use that technique on the slapping it down on the table till they sort of get used to it. And then I'll do it a little bit above the horizon level. So, and that works. At first, there are some children who just, just don't want to look. No, 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 no. So the Slapping on the table works. Check your content. Do you have enough high interest words in there? Are you trying to teach all of the high frequency words, which are meaningless to the learner? What's your ratio? Two high interest words out of five? Maybe go to three out of five. Why should he look at the cards? He needs to be interested in them. Does he need a five to five ratio in the beginning? You know, five high interest cards? Turn off the lights, give her a flashlight pen. How fast are you moving the cards? Are you too slow? Are you using red ink? Try two inch high lowercase letters. Is there an undiagnosed visual problem? And sometimes there is. Okay, not enough energy releasing movement before sitting, get up and play ball or whatever. Experiment, let them choose. I, I've done this with students, you know, given the identical material, large type, small type, hands down, they want the big one. All right. Sandwich style teaching. This is your second strategy. Very simple. I don't care what you're teaching. I don't care what the material is. It can be a personal page, personal book, lotto game. It can be one of my high frequency books. Doesn't matter. You're going to teach it sandwich style. And what that means is the bread on top and on the bottom are the flashcards that you've chosen. And you don't do two different groups before and after. No, you whatever you flashed before, you use those same cards after. The peanut butter and jelly is the really cool material that you have chosen for them to read. All right, for instance, I'll flash the spaghetti, five spaghetti cards, we read the spaghetti book, flash five the five cards again. All right, we never, ever, ever teach unrelated material. We just, we don't teach random words. That's not reading for meaning. We do this instead. It's all about reading for meaning. All right. They must relate. The cards have to relate to the filling in the sandwich. All right. 
All right, putting it all together. This is a video that this mom sent me. She's a, a, a pediatrician at Stanford and she had attended one of my all day workshops uh, several years ago and she just went to town with it. So she, I'm gonna show you the sandwich style as she's doing it. Now the video stops before she repeats the cards, but you see her flash the cards, read the personal book, and then she would have gone on and flashed the cards again. Slap, whoops, sorry. Go. Slide, climb, swing, on, park, slide, climb, swing, on, park, slide, climb, swing, on, park. Okay, Anna. You read. The park. Now she did a personal book exactly as I teach in the book. No pictures. Let me get ready. Okay. I Ten, three, four, five, five. Same sentence, big picture, reward. I can fly at the park. I can fly at the park. Good job. Okay, you. All right. So her fast flashing makes me look terribly slow. <laughs> And, and laminating the cards helps, right? Errorless testing. This avoids FOF syndrome. It's something I made up, fear of failure syndrome. And you can recognize it in your learner, I'm sure. Fear of failure. If it looks too hard, I'm out of here. If I'm verbal, I'm gonna tell you it's too hard. If I'm not verbal, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna, in some way, just resist, right? All right, errorless testing. It's very gentle and they really can't fail. Step one is you're training them matching. Step two, selecting. Step three, naming. This was developed by Pat Olwine at the University of Washington many years ago. It still works. <laughs> but I suggest a fourth step, a fourth testing technique. Uh, because they can name a card without being able to generalize it. They can't re-identify it anywhere. You know, anywhere that they would see it, can they read that word anywhere or not? And for your cheap five minute generalizing tool is personal pages. It's the way to use the vocabulary you hope they're learning and you build it into a, a, a little story, a one page story about them, whatever's going on for them. We'll talk about that later. All right. In the beginning, you give prompts, verbal prompts like the first sound of the letter, of the word, like s -s -s, if it's C, for example. Physical prompts, you can tap the right answer. Encouragement, great job. All right, so assuming you've been teaching these words, all right, matching, here's puppy, can you put, show me puppy? Can you put this on puppy? Selecting, oh wait, field of two as the learner progresses, you can increase that field to four images, six. Don't go beyond that, it's really confusing visually. All right, collecting, show me pizza. All right, naming, what is this? But like I said, then you have to go past that and make sure that they can generalize that word, that they're not just identifying it on that card. All right, personal pages, we'll talk about it. Fast, easy, effective generalizing tool, costs you nothing, you just need paper and markers. I use uh, colored markers because it's more fun for the kids. And to get buy-in, I let them choose their favorite color, and then I write out the story. All right. Kids love it. It's so easy. Easy, easy, easy. Now, here's some examples. All right. You see, I'm sticking to, I have a system of double spacing between every single word, extra spacing between the lines, and very, very clear printing if you're going to do this by hand. Of course, you can do it on the computer. You know, in my in my lessons, I have to do it on the spot, so it's handwritten. All right, now there will always be some brand new uh, vocabulary words when you're writing out a personal page, because for instance, Eduardo didn't know the word watch. He's crazy about his watch, but he didn't know how to read it. All right, so uh, and room, he didn't know that. So I would make out flashcards for those words he didn't know. I knew his literacy level. I knew he could read the rest of it. 
So we always have to write it at their literacy level. All right. Having a bad day. If your child is having a bad day, this works beautifully. Nothing is off limits. So if the child is addicted to his iPad, you write a personal page about his iPad. All right. And I would sometimes highlight the brand new words. So this, this young man could read everything except those words. So I made flashcards for those. All right. And here's an example. This is from the interior of my lookbook, which is book number two in my high frequency series. So because that's so repetitious and there's a picture cue on account of those are very boring words. Go see the uh, down up. Uh, no, that doesn't have to do with their heart's desire. Right. So I do use pictures in the entire high frequency series. Just not in the picture books. You have to turn the page before you get to the nice big picture. But let's say you're really not sure if your learner has memorized those sentences, which he probably has, uh, in relation to the picture, or can he read those words? So let's just say you use your creativity and you make a personal page. Let's say Jason is the learner, Debbie's his sister. All right, this whole page is written with vocabulary that this child, if he's at this book, has already learned. I didn't put anything else in there. You can do this. You, it's a it's a mm, it's a process. It's a mental process, and once you catch on to it, it's a piece of cake to do that. You achieve two goals with one page. You motivate the learner. It's about them, and you repeat vocabulary. You repeat, and you keep it in a binder. It's like a diary, and it's a vocabulary review tool that you can't beat. It's awesome. All right. Um, I, you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to. Uh, we don't have time to go through all of this. I have a handout. I'll send it to Leslie and she can email it to you. I hope. <laughs> I think that'll work fine. All right. And it'll tell you exactly how to do it. You do not take dictation from the learner. If the learner is verbal and gives you an idea of what he would like you to write about, that's great. You rewrite it. You're teaching language and grammar. All right. And you write at the literacy level of the learner. Print neatly. Make flashcards. All right. Each sandwich style. All right. Don't let the learner repeat the word, right? Have the learner read the page. Give as much help as is needed. You fast flash. You're doing sandwich style. Doesn't matter what it is. Flash the words. Read the material. Flash the same words. All right. All right. Visual design for the brain. How are we going to do this? Lots of white space on the page. Sans serif type. That means a type font without a little curly cues on the end. There are hundreds. Helvetica, Verdana, Tahoma, those are just a few. Double or even triple space between each word. Extra space between the lines of type. No pictures in the same visual field in the beginning. Once the learner's catching on, fine. All right. So this is an example from the very, very first book. See the white space. See the double spacing between the words. See the, the font. It's a sans serif font. All right. This is the next level up, the primer level. You don't see the cat. You read the riddle first, and then you turn the page. This is the first grade level. And I still stick with the double spacing, the, the sans serif font, lots of white space. And I break up the black type because it can be so intimidating. You break it up, and it makes them feel like, oh, you know, I think I can do this. But if you show them a long black paragraph, whoo, you know, unless they're <laughs> really reading well it'll be difficult all right so let me see here we go all right so i want to talk about the four components of my program we engage with fun teach what's necessary which is the high frequency list we evaluate comprehension and i give you lots of directions <laughs> all right and my website, I, I'm not sure I put, yeah, I did put that up. It's specialreads.com. All right. This is the fun part. Totally fun. And you start there. What book, what book do you want to start with? All right. And then you gather the, the flashcards and you teach sandwich style. Now, 
This is the part that the school says he's got to learn. He's got to know these. You have to learn one list before you can go on to the next list and the next and get bumped up and, you know, progress. All right. So that's what that is about. Uh, comprehension evaluation. Every one of these levels ties into the particular books in my series that teach those. Now, I designed this so that children who are completely nonverbal can take these tests. All right. Um, and I think I'm not sure I could have the interior pages on this slide deck. Quick start guide is there for you. How to start <laughs> the book and then a parent and educator guide. All right. A little bit inside looking inside the parent and educator guide. Scaffolding plans up at the top. Letter sounds. That's where you start. How do you design a teaching session? How do you, you can track your time management tool. I have session one and session two minutes up there. I don't care if it's one minute twice a day. That's better than nothing. So don't think, oh, I just really don't have time for this. I'm not asking. The brain is not asking for much. Really. It makes the difference. And then there are vocabulary lists for running records. If you want to keep track of what, what words they're still missing or what they've already learned. All right. And the flashcards are included for the high frequency. And then I email everybody uh, PDFs, printable, print and cut flashcards for the high interest cards that are not going to be in those decks of high frequency cards. All right. Oh, yeah, good. I have an interior page. So the student silently reads the sentence and then circles the correct answer. This is the next level up. This is the first grade level. I use uh, color coding for the first version of every single test, second version of every test, no color coding. We're teaching them referential comprehension, not inferential, which comes later. Referential, they can refer back to the text. Ooh, the puppy, oh, I get it. I can look back and find the answer to that. If I can't remember, I can go find it. Right, resources, this is that book, my book, uh, that's my website. YouTube and Facebook, and I want to show you how to find them. So Facebook, every week or so, I put up a new video, but at the same time, I put it up on YouTube, which is easier to get to. <laughs> All right. But if you want to go to my Facebook page and like it so that you automatically get these, you go, you search for Down Syndrome Reading with Natalie Hale. On YouTube, search for Natalie Hale Down Syndrome. That will pull up what you're looking for all right this is the facebook page now on youtube it's a two-step process okay first type in natalie hale down syndrome you'll get this page ignore it except for this click on the profile picture because that's where you want to go that'll take you right here and as soon as you click videos you'll get them all and right here is a search box so for instance, if you want to search for comprehension or you want to search for nonverbal or whatever, you just type it right in there and it will pull up every video that I've made about that. And I, I still keep making up, making new ones. All right, to review. Oh, and we have one minute left. <laughs> Letter sounds from the beginning, initial whole word recognition, right brain learning techniques, a base of high interest materials, Analytic phonics, if needed, not, it's also known as implicit phonics. And what analytic phonics does is go from the meaningful whole word, which is learned first, and then you break it down. You decode it. All right, strategies recap. Fast flash, sandwich style, errorless testing methods, free from Pat Olwine, and then I add the fourth one, generalizing with personal pages. Special ed rules, small task size. Frequency twice a day, duration, short teaching sessions. Hook them. Hook them first, then teach them. We hook them with the topic of the materials and then we teach them. All right. Your first step well, this is for people who have my program. To find out the literacy level, you can either use the comprehension evaluation books or you can guess and pick one of the high frequency books where you think they are and see if that's too hard or it's too easy and then you adjust your level. All right. All right, for example, you use those three for an emergent. All right. All right, we have to stop. I'm going to stop the screen share. Oops, wait a minute.
<laughs> Homework. Okay. Uh, let me quickly, quickly, quickly just see what that was. Homework. Five minutes twice a day from now until the next time we meet. Teach for five minutes twice a day. Okay? Five minutes twice a day. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Natalie. Uh, as you guys can see, uh, we've just barely scratched the surface uh, when we talk about strategies for teaching reading. So um, I hope, I believe that you got something great out of our, our meeting this afternoon. And please mark your calendars uh, for October 26th when Natalie will be with us again and we'll continue our conversation on uh, reading development. And please note uh, there's a change on the original flyer. We changed the date from the 13th to the 26th. So help us spread that word. Um, Natalie, you've got some nice uh, comments on the chat. I think um, you, were, you were speaking to your audience. They appreciate the information and definitely could relate to your experiences. So thank you again for your time and your expertise. Are there any questions? I don't see any just yet. Um, okay, how can I see the comments? I've clicked on comments. Um, but I don't see any questions. No, ma'am, I don't either. Okay, did they know that they could ask questions? We'll, we'll be sure to, oh, we you did. did. Actually, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. 